Well, thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Welcome. I'm Megan Meadows. I coordinate La Pietra Dialogues here at NYU Florence. And we are so happy to have um, Professor Joyce Absol um, back here with us uh, tonight uh, at NYU Florence. Let's see, when was it the first uh, time that we organized uh, a dialogue six together? Years ago. Six years ago. Um, Professor Absol um, was. Uh, was, was teaching here at NYU Florence, and we organized our first dialogue on um, peace, uh, peace Museums. I think it was on Peace Museums, featuring Professor Palotti's um, Casa della Pace, um, La Finlandia uh, in Bologna. Um, and so we are extremely, extremely um, pleased to, uh, to welcome you back um, for the second uh, edition. Um, Professor Absol, most of you already know her, um, is one of uh, the most beloved professors uh, in the Liberal Studies program um, at NYU uh, in New York. Claudia is, is second An incredible in thesis advisor, I will say. Uh, many of you, uh, LS freshmen who um, are starting um, your first year of NYU here in Florence, um, will have a chance to um, get to know Professor Absol better when you go back to New York um, next semester. Um, she's just released um, her latest book, um, Introducing Peace Museums. Um, you'll be able to find a copy of it um, outside on the book's table um, in the, in the salon. Um, and she will be um, speaking more um, to you about it this evening. Um, Vittorio Palotti, uh, he's the founder and director of the Casa per la Pace la Finlandia in Bologna. Finlanda. Fin Finlanda. It is spinning mill. What is it? Is it, is it in English uh, spinning mill? Spinning, spinning, spinning mill. Finlanda. Finlanda. No, Finlandia is a country, I say. Yes. North yes. Europe. Yes. No? See, see, students, you should never be afraid to try to speak Italian. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. You should just be corrected very kindly by those around you. So, um, uh, and um, has, uh, has collected a very important um, a collection of peace posters um, since um, he started as a peace activist in Italy in uh, the 1960s, uh, really. So uh, yes. he will be uh, talking more about, about his work over the course of the dialogue. We're very honored to have Professor um, Abate uh, here with us. Um, this evening as well, Professor Abate is one of the most important figures of the nonviolent uh, movement in Italy. Um, and so hopefully we will... <laughs> He's not agreeing. One of the most important and humble. They say that, <laughs> that, <laughs> the probably <laughs> should say this to say this book. <laughs> I'm not so sure. But okay. Well, thank you all for being here with us tonight. Thank you. I'm happy to I was you. here six years ago. I was when it was the meeting. Uh, so this is a this is a, a reunion, this is a homecoming of sorts. Great. Well, thank you very much, and Professor Absol. Thank you, and thank you all for being here. I know it's the middle; uh, it's close to the end of the term, so I really appreciate it. And to see some familiar voices and colleagues, thank you so much for making this effort. And a student of mine from NYU, Claudia, thank you, thank you all for, and my daughter for supporting me, particularly technologically. Uh, so it, it's wonderful to be here. Um, you know, uh, we are living in a time uh, of violence and a time in which people feel terrible vulnerability. And so talking about peace, I suggest peace museums, the possibilities of addressing conflicts Nonviolently or reducing conflicts. I think it's a particularly timely and challenging and difficult but important undertaking. So what I would like to do in, the, in, um, in my session is go through a few images from uh, these peace museums. Uh, I argue in this book that there is a distinct um, type of museum called a peace museum. And uh, the cover of the book is a white poppy with peace on it. Does anyone have any idea about what this white poppy could represent? Does anyone know what the red poppy represents? Yes. 
No, I was thinking about um, the, the red poppy is used as a to commemorate in the Commonwealth, usually in Britain and the Commonwealth, uh, to commemorate the fall of the First World War, and it's also the symbol of the British Legion uh, and of all sorts of organisations that support veterans. Absolutely. So I guess that's the yes, answer. yes. In the peace poppy, uh, the red peace poppy uh, came out of a poem. Uh, after World War I, in Flanders Field, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place, and in there, the lark still bravely signing fly amongst the dead so valiantly. So the, the, white, the red peas poppy in Remembrance Day is very, very important throughout Europe, commemorating first World War I and then World War II. The white peas poppy emerged in the 1930s in the UK because it was, there was a feeling strongly that the red poppy was being used to prepare for the next war and that the white peas poppy could, should both commemorate those who died in the past but also work not toward justifying the next war but instead uh, uh, work toward the challenges of uh, settling conflicts and differences peacefully. So uh, that's why the White Peace Poppy is on the cover of the book. What is a peace museum? And in my book I talk about peace museums promote understanding peace and movements for social justice as ongoing significant parts of history. Through their exhibits and their activities, they promote cultures of peace. Uh, they provide a nuanced, critical evaluations of wars, and they're often uh, critical of the idea of a just war, uh, and, uh, the, and talk about conflicts and their ongoing repercussions. The World War II did not end in 1945, except officially. The repercussions of that on society, on people, on their lives continued afterwards and as well as educating about the possibilities to end violence and look forward toward peacekeeping, reconciliation, and other peace initiatives. So what I'm arguing in this book is that peace museums, uh, as I'm calling them, and they overlap with other types of museums, um, are looking beyond simply memorialization, which is very important, uh, but also of entering in histories that are largely unknown, Histor histories of uh, nonviolence, of marching, of sit-ins, um, as an alternative way to think about history. The earliest peace museum we know about in Europe was created in 1903 in Lucerne. It was called the International Museum of War and Peace. And the person who donated it was, of course, and this is a very interesting, a successful capitalist. And we see over and over again successful capitalists like Carnegie. Uh, uh, here we have uh, Jean de Bloch, who was born in Poland, and uh, is often called the father of the study of civilian warfare because he commissioned um, a series of specialists to study war. And they came up, and he asked psych, sort of psych, psychologists, military men, non military people to study all aspects of war. And came up with what he said was war is now impossible. Why is war no, now impossible in 1902? Because we are creating more and more weaponry that will kill more and more people. This may sound a little familiar. Uh, and he argued that it's suicide to continue to spend so much on armaments. And so uh, he spoke to Tsar Nicholas II, he went to the Hague Peace Conference and spoke, and he created this uh, first a temporary exhibit and then a permanent site in which he said that uh, war is testifying against itself in this first war museum. It, history bears in it the seeds of its own demise if instead of spending on bullets, uh, we don't st spend on helping uh, those people who need <coughs> help. 
So, uh, so uh, Block created this, and he had over 4,400 uh, pieces of military, uh, as well as, and this was the Peace Room, in which early Nobel Peace Prize winners, uh, writers such as Tolstoy, Scenes of Peace, uh, in which he wanted to educate the, pu the public both on the danger of war. They actually had trenches uh, outside the museum uh, to prevent future war. Um, and uh, unfortunately, um, uh, Block uh, died in 1903, and the museum ended with the end of World War I. But at its height, the museum had 60,000 visitors a year coming to Luzerne uh, to learn about uh, peace through, in part, learning about the history of the damages of war. So there is a trajectory in which peace museums historically have been anti-war sites. But many of the museums I'm talking about do more than simply talk against war. They also talk uh, about building peace. And have any of you been to The Hague in Amsterdam? OK, put it on your list. I know people here travel a lot. And this is the Nobel Peace Prize. I'm sorry, the Nobel, uh, the, ah, the, the Hague Palace. Peace Palace Palace. in The Hague. And, uh, and it was um, established uh, after The Hague Peace Conferences when they decided the 37 heads of state came together and decided that um, we have to uh, begin uh, to set up a place where countries can come together and arbitrate. And uh, Carnegie agreed, uh, the, uh, Andrew Carnegie agreed uh, to give the funding of $1.5 million for the Peace Palace. Uh, Carnegie, some of you know, may know his famous uh, Gospel of Wealth in which he said that after spending so much time accumulating, I now have to begin the infinitely more serious and difficult task of wise distribution. And so he distributed monies for, uh, for organs and churches, uh, for libraries throughout the United States. As a matter of fact, one of the stipulations of his libraries were that all citizens could, had to be allowed to take out books and to be in these libraries. And this, of course, was uh, a time in which this generally was not the rule uh, in the South, for example, but, uh, but all of the Carnegie-funded uh, libraries uh, uh, were integrated uh, from the early 1900s <laughs> on. So the, the, uh, the Hague Peace Palace continues to be run uh, by the Carnegie Foundation, um, and it is a working center of the International Court of Justice. And in 2013, on its centenary, finally, if you go to The Hague, you'll be able to go to, uh, to their center for free, uh, where uh, you can visit and see the history of the Peace Palace. Dolce Bellum in Expertis. Anybody's Latin? What does it mean? Dolce Bellum in Expertis. Sweet. Well, right? Well, uh, war is sweet to those who have never experienced it. And that's one of the first things you see when you enter the Peace Palace and when you uh, uh, go to the, uh, the new uh, uh, center uh, for visitors. And tens of thousands of people every month come in busloads to see the palace and then go in and visit. And, uh, and again, uh, the, the, uh, the introduction comes out of Block, whom I mentioned earlier, his study of war, and it shows how, what in 1898 countries around the world were spending on military. Um, so many of the um, ideas here that we see in seeds uh, become increasingly resonant uh, over time. Uh, the study of war and the anti-war tradition is one art tradition. Some of you may know Kati Kalowitz and her beautiful drawings. She lost her son in World War I and became uh, an artist who, who showed through her artwork. Anybody else think of famous artworks of peace? Anti-war tradition? The Guernica. The Guernica, and we'll talk about the Guernica Museum is, of course, among the most famous um, uh, studying war 
to begin uh, to think about peace. Anyone else? The Hiroshima panels, beautifully done by Yuri and Toshi uh, uh, after uh, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And as a matter of fact, I took a group of GL students there this fall um, because uh, some of the panels were in Brooklyn, New York. And these have been seen by millions of people. Um, uh, again, studying more uh, to, uh, to think about alternatives. Uh, the next Peace Museum that I would love to talk about is the Bradford Peace Museum in the UK. And the Bradford Peace Museum is known uh, because um, uh, Bradford had been a, is a center of diversity. And uh, there were riots, and if I asked you, anyone here from the UK, if I asked you, do you know Bradford, you'd say, oh yeah, that's the place that had the riots in the early 1990s, and again in 2001. But in fact, Bradford also has uh, a, a very strong uh, tradition of peace and diversity. And the uh, Gerald Holton designed uh, for the UK campaign for nucle nuclear disarmament uh, in the 1980s, the peace symbol. And that peace symbol at the time, uh, so he, he, he got ready for a march, uh, and uh, one of his co-marchers said, this will never go. <laughs> and he also, uh, he never patented. He wanted everyone to have it. And there are different interpretations. He wrote to you, Brock, a peace historian, Holtum, um, that he, you know, he was an artist, not well known. Uh, he said, I drew myself, the representative of an individual in despair, with hands palm out, stretched outwards and downwards, in the manner of Goya's peasant. And Goya, of course, has the disasters of war, which is another famous anti-war art uh, exhibit before the firing squad. I formalized the drawing into a line and put a circle around it. It was ridiculous at first and such a puny thing, but then suddenly I strengthened it and uh, it became more and more a symbol that people seemed to take to. Uh, at first, Holton was not happy with the symbol because it didn't convey the necessary positive and creative action to combat nuclear threat. And while he was painting slogans, he decided, you know, I want to turn this symbol upside down so it could represent the tree of life, the tree of which Christ had been crucified and which for Christians was a symbol of hope and resurrection. Furthermore, that inverted image of a figure with palms outstretched upwards and outwards also represent the semaphore signal for you, for unilateral. So the peace symbol in Bradford Peace Museum which has the Peace Museum, uh, has many of his drawings because he came from the Bradford area. They also have at the Bradford Peace Museum a series of banners. Here's a series, Remembrance is Not Enough. Remember we started with the poppy? Um, so here you have Thalia Campbell who created 50 quilts and was in the sit-in in Greenham Common. Uh, that sat in in the 1980s against uh, NATO putting nuclear warheads, uh, the same as Cosimo. This was all part of a European movement uh, of anti-nuclearism. And uh, these poppies are of different colors, uh, symbolizing different groups, different types of people. And what they have uh, in the middle, of course, some of them is the peace symbol. They're very, very beautiful. Um, uh, quilts to see. And here you have an example of the Bradford Peace Museum. Uh, we are running out of poppies, another example of art. And this is a peace wreath um, saying uh, by, by another artist, Emily Johns, which she took uh, uh, to a march in downtown London during the British support of sanctions by the U.S. government against Iraq. These were very controversial sanctions, and so this was used in peaceful protest uh, against the sanction in Iraq. So I'm just showing you different pieces from these museums that talk about art as a way in which to think about creatively uh, resisting uh, movements of militarism, uh, and also art in expressing 
uh, the possibility of a theme in many peace museums, peace within, peace, the idea that creativity um, uh, can be part of uh, the peaceful undertaking. This is uh, Kyoto Museum of World, for World Peace in Ritsukumaisen University, um, and it's focused on peace exhibit. And Japan has more peace museums than any country in the world. Many of them are anti-nuclear. Peace museums often aren't only, as I said before, memorial sites. They also face history. And in this case, the uh, Japanese uh, Kyoto Museum for World Peace is at a university. How many other universities uh, do you know that have peace museums? Do a lot of universities have peace museums, do you think? Does anyone know, do you know of any that have peace museums? No. Why do you think there might be a little problem having a peace museum that's against in this case, against nuclear energy, when the government is for nuclear energy. That is uh, saying, you know, during World War II, the Japanese committed atrocities, exhibits about that. Um, and we have to face that, and we have to apologize, and we have to give reparations to Korea. Um, and uh, we can't allow ourselves to ally with governments um, and uh, who want to cre help us uh, promote conflicts. Why do you think there might not be uh, support by the government for this? Well, it's counter, right? It's counter to the government. So there aren't peace museums at universities. Even NYU doesn't have a peace museum, right? Why? why because, of course, you're not going to get state funding. You're, you're, uh, you're uh, really, re it's a site of resistance, and that's part of my argument here, that peace museums can be sites of resistance um, to the state. And so there are very few sites uh, of peace museums at universities. There's one uh, at the University of Chicago. Uh, I'm sorry, at, Ch at the, at Chicago, the University of Illinois in Chicago, uh, uh, but this is a real rarity, and that is again because um, uh, peace museums uh, tend uh, to be sites of persuasion, and sometimes they tend to be sites of resistance to the just war narrative. And here's uh, another exhibit at Kyoto on uh, nuclear energy and radiation. And one of the key things uh, about Kyoto Museum is its anti-nuclear stance. And Professor Anzai, who was the director for many years, has been a leader in uh, going to Fukushima and in setting up exhibits uh, uh, to talk about the dangers of nuclear energy. Guernica, you mentioned Guernica. Uh, the Guernica Peace Museum, if you go to Bilbao, many of you may, the beautiful Bilbao Guggenheim, take a 35-minute trip uh, by bus to uh, the Guernica Peace Museum, where again, after the fall of Franco, uh, uh, the local community wanted to investigate and exhibit their own uh, culture, uh, Bas culture, and they also wanted to find out who was really responsible for the bombing of Guernica in 1937. But what they decided to do is not only to talk about the destruction in Guernica, but also to talk about the history of peace and uh, the possibility of reconciliation. And so part of the museum is a history of peace art, including the allegory in, in, the, in Siena, uh, 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 the, uh, that exists, mm -hmm. and uh, the Guernica Peace Museum has not only um, does it have a display of Guernica uh, and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights around it, but it has a, remor rem a memorial that says, and a film that says, Remembrance and Reconciliation. And this is sort of my argument about these peace museums, that they are really looking both to memorialize and to reconcile. So the city of Bernica, uh, which in 1937 was bombed and devastated, and this became and is a cause celeb 
of the brutality of civil bombing of civilians. And the city of Forsheim, Germany, which in 1945 was also bombed and almost totally destroyed, uh, uh, reconciled. They had a reconciliation ceremony. And uh, youth from each city uh, visited each other. And they've had a series of projects together. And part of what the museum, this, it's called the Guernica Peace Museum, is about is, not, is remembering finding out the history of what happened, who was responsible, but also of going and thinking through the future and reconciling for next generations. Of course, this is extremely difficult to do, and it's a very rare example. Here is their living art project, uh, where one generation passes on to the next generation the light of hope and peace. And when I was there at a conference, and Vittorio was there as well, and his, his wife, was there, Fiorello, was there as well, in the middle of our being part of such a ceremony, two masked young men from the ETA, this is uh, Freedom and Terror uh, for Bosque uh, Independence, came up on that statue, and everybody stopped and the people at the museum let them do and make their protest, and then they left, and we continued the ceremony. So again, these are very alternative histories uh, uh, of uh, reconciliation and trying to move forward in a time of conflict. And of course, part of the Peace Museum is about the Bas conflict and how can it be resolved peacefully. Finally, uh, the Dayton International Peace Museum in Dayton, Ohio, which uh, it was created by two teachers um, who decided um, that, you know, we really need a center here after the Dayton Peace Accords. Uh, and so they, they raised the funding and got a house. And at the Dayton Peace Museum, they um, they have a, a series of community activities. Its first 10 years, and I just passed this around, its first 10 years were, donate, uh, were dedicated uh, to the work of local people and was completely carried out by volunteers. And now it has um, uh, a head of the, uh, who sort of coordinates everybody. I'm passing around um, just a piece of literature uh, that comes out of the Peace Museum. Uh, because one of the things that um, Peace Museums do is they archive history uh, that otherwise might disappear. Much like Vittorio, you'll hear his posters. If it weren't for that collection of posters, that history might not be known. And in this case, they, this is a local hero. Uh, his, name, his name was Ted Studebaker, uh, and um, De, uh, Ted came from Dayton, Ohio. And during, uh, again, during uh, the Vietnam War, he refused to serve. He was a conscientious objector. And one of the things many of these peace museums have are diaries and other artifacts of people who, re who resisted war, resisted militarism. And, uh, and, in, uh, <clears throat> and so he went to Vietnam, and uh, he was killed there by the Viet Cong uh, uh, during a raid on a village where he was living and working. He was doing alternative service. And I just read a little piece. Uh, Claudia, would you can start, please? She's in class now. <laughs> <laughs> Ted was raised in Ohio, where brave men regularly grow and he wasn't afraid to get a letter calling him to the war. He was polite and he wanted to do right. So he wrote back and said, I've learned from my people that I must not fight, but I'd like to work instead. Thank you. Um, would you read the chorus? Oh, I'm not afraid to go, folks. I'm not afraid to die. I've just got something else in mind that I would like to try. Give me a shovel instead of a gun, and I'll say so long for now. And if I die, I'll die making something instead of tearing something down. Thank you. So again, um, this is a history that's not very well known, and a song that uh, was created uh, from his story uh, of uh, his uh, doing, creating alternative service rather than uh, uh, serving in the military, and uh, and he, he was killed. 
uh, in, in Vietnam. Finally, we have here and uh, from uh, Casa yeah. Pela Pace, uh, uh, mass occupation, everyone to Kumiso. Again, uh, this Vittorio will talk much more about these posters, but uh, again, the anti-nuclear movement as a very important uh, piece of resistance uh, to militarization and uh, and uh, its its effects. So I will let you talk much more about the posters. Finally, the wallpaper on the Nobel Peace Center in Oslo, uh, another place to put on your book. And here you have, this is about 15 years old, uh, that finally the Nobel, you may know Alfred Nobel, another, right, a very successful capitalist who in his will uh, uh, designated five prizes and one would be and uh, four went to Sweden and one went to Norway and the one that went to Norway was the Peace Prize and so you have this uh, interesting history of peace again not everybody we know who's won the Nobel Peace Prize and you can think of uh, Henry Kissinger for one among others who was totally successful uh, in um, but that, but of course, peace is political, and uh, in the book I talk about uh, how these decisions are made. One person who was nominated five times in the 1930s and 1940s for the Nobel Peace Prize, anyone want to guess, trivial pursuit here, uh, uh, did not get it, uh, perhaps because the British government really didn't want him to get the Nobel Peace Prize, and that was Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, the uh, five times the committee debated this. Uh, some people wanted it, some people didn't. So again, peace is always political. But the Nobel uh, Center is uh, the most technologically sophisticated of any of these um, museum sites that I talk about, and it brings, uh, you know, it brings the history of the, the Nobel Peace Prize winner each year, whoever wins. Uh, here's Malala and Kalish. Uh, uh, there is a temporary exhibit put up every year in their honor telling about their history and within the museum itself uh, you can find out about each of the different Nobel Peace Prize winners and their lives and what they accomplished and then there are these amazing uh, temporary exhibits that are brought in uh, every year. So each of these museums has a very different history and different traditions uh, but all of them are committed in different ways to the possibility of a discourse that says that we really need to give uh, peace a chance and that we can give peace a chance um, and that there are alternatives to conflict. I started this uh, by saying um, how important I think because we are living once again in such a time of terror and heightened conflict to perhaps really rethink alternative means. Uh, and I think that this is a very rich history, these museums. In Bradford at UK, after the riots and uh, a series of young men um, were uh, part of the bombings in London, the Peace Museum came together, reached out to immigrants from uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, Bangladesh, India, and other places, and began to have a series of dialogues. So these museums also serve as sites of community and inclusiveness. They run in many ways against the grain of history, but they also tell and emphasize a history that I think we can all learn from and have a lot to tell us. So thank you very much. I hope uh, to be on the stage. So I uh, begin uh, my reading with a uh, um, short presentation of uh, our center, is a Centro Documentazione del Manifesto Pacifista Internazionale, International Peace Posters Documentation Center, in uh, La Filanda. In, uh, Casalecchia è vero in Bologna. Allora, 
e è centro di documentazione eh, was founded in Bologna in 1993 and has been collecting the posters since uh, its first exhibition in 1985 today the posters are more than 5000 the largest collection of pacifist posters in the world uh, from 1985 until today the posters were displayed in over 240 exhibitions organized by political cultural social and religious groups local authorities and universities in different parts of Italy, in Switzerland and Germany. Over the years, posters were hung in a variety of places, from municipalities to schools. Exhibitions in schools allowed students to produce, with the teacher's supervision, articles, videos, CD, drawings, posters and other artifacts. CDMPI is uh, the acronym of uh, Centro Documentazione, CDMPI. CDMPI's main activities over the years have been collecting, archiving and promoting posters and other materials, including books, pamphlets, reviews, leaflets, articles, documents, photos, videos, postcards, gadgets. The center also organized 16 thematic itinerant peace posters exhibitions. Um, I uh, remember only two or three, but uh, 16. We have on the table a book uh, where uh, um, is uh, uh, the names of uh, all uh, these exhibitions. Uh, fifth, one is uh, 50 Years of Peace, uh, 1950 is 2000, on the walls of Europe. This is it's in English and Italian. Um, And um, mm, the last chapter is an uh, 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 exhibition on uh, this book, because uh, it, uh, it is on the table outside. Some of these exhibitions also included a guide for visitors. To celebrate uh, its uh, 30th uh, anniversary, CDMPI created uh, the poster Seminare Pace, Zowing Peace, which depicts 10 posters on the sides and in the middle, the complete list of 240 exhibitions. Uh, later, uh, perhaps, uh, if we have time, uh, I, I'll show you uh, this poster. Um, from 2002, CDMPI is a member of the International Network of Museums for Peace. Uh, the book in Italian, this manifesti raccontano le molte vie per chiudere con la guerra, in English, uh, the many ways to get rid of war, uh, was published uh, in December uh, 2014 with the preface by Peter van den Dongen, his coordinator, general coordinator of uh, 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 Network of Museums for Peace and uh, another preface was written by uh, John Sapser. Uh, the posters images I'm going to illustrate uh, are taken from this book. There are 10 poster images, uh, they are uh, in this book. 
Now, some copies uh, of an English paper version are available here. This is an English version. Uh, as a, the Italian version is 200 pages. The English version, 18 pages more. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> uh, uh, 66 uh, illustrations. And uh, the cost is uh, not uh, high because uh, I spend uh, it uh, and uh, I am editor, uh, author, editor uh, and distributor. <laughs> <laughs> Only 20 euros. Uh, uh, 20 euros, uh, Italian and English version, you can find also. Uh, for the buyers uh, of a copy of one of these uh, two books, uh, it is free of charge, a copy of the book 50 years of peace in Europe. You have a book of this. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is a, a forward. This is forward. Now uh, we go uh, for, uh, to illustrate uh, some of these uh, uh, posters. Hello, right, this uh, poster. Uh, uh, this is the uh, 11th uh, National Conference of the Radiarash Network Association in Rimini, March 30 to April 1, 1990. Uh, the subtitle, this is the title. The subtitle says uh, The Hope of the Poor Challenges the monsters of reasons. In Tiananmen Square, Beijing, a young man stands in the way of a line of tanks sent by the Chinese government to repress the uprising of young people who are fighting for democracy through nonviolent means. In this poster, radiation networks intent is clear. Only through nonviolent action can we effectively promote and enhance nonviolence. This is a, a comment of this talk. Next one. Peace from all our balconies. Italy 2003. Subtitle Let's paint towns in the colors of peace. Let's say no to all wars. Let's say yes to the road towards dialogue. Let's hang out the peace flag from our balconies. An explanation of the poster's colorful motto is given in the title of the passes on the yellow rectangle, yellow rectangle down. Let's put our no to war on display. Promoters of this special initiative include the Rick di Lilliput, Lilliput Network, uh, Associazione Beati Costruttori di Pace, Blessed Peacemakers Association and the Pacifist Priest Alex Tanotelli, very famous in Italy, and perhaps not only in Italy, I think. No? In Italy, no less than 2-3 million peace flags were hung, hung, out, hung out of windows and balconies. This is uh, an evaluation of Tanotelli in 2004. Many peace flags uh, were hung in other places. <laughs> Listen. On trees, in factories, at churches, on railings, in schools, at city halls, in shops and Paris, uh, I forget uh, many other places. There are a lot of different places, everywhere. The peace flag movement uh, extended uh, 
to other European countries, including Germany, Switzerland, France and Spain. And we have seen by our eyes <laughs> this place in Switzerland and Austria, in Austria also. Unfortunately, the Iraqi war was not averted. This nonviolent action, however, led to widespread discussion and contributed to an increase in knowledge and adhesion to the principles of peace and nonviolence. This was a positive conclusion ever. ever, ever. Next one, ah, this, uh, I like one of it's uh, black and white, but uh, it's uh, <coughs> full of uh, means, of significance. Also, uh, this poster is untitled, no date, no author. The flower, the air of wheat, and the blade of grass are all symbols of life. They stand in stark contrast to the pierced, pierced and abandoned helmet, itself a symbol of death. The image is clearly elaborated by the poem of Bertolt Brecht, the big German poet, whose words invite the viewer to reflect deeply. Brecht wrote the poem during or shortly after the end of the Second World War. He was clearly alluding to the German people who had uncritically subscribed to a strongly militaristic ideology and who, as a result, had suffered a terrible defeat. But uh, I also, uh, there is this in the book, uh, uh, the translation of the uh, poetry. You see, in the, the page. Uh, 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 here. Okay. Yes, what page? page? 67. 67. Yes. No. Uh, an English translation of the poetry. Yeah. Look at the helmets of the vanquished. This is Ber Bertolt Brecht's work. Look at the helmets of the vanquished. Yet surely the moment when we came undone was not when they were smitten from our heads, but when we first agreed to put them on. Oh, um, in the book, uh, uh, it is, uh, they have written many other comments, uh, more than uh, comments uh, I, I, I read, of course. Of course. Not, uh, we have no time uh, in our stuff. So, <coughs> Your bank is financing the apartheid. Stop. The title. Uh, was uh, published in Paris. Uh, no date. Uh, Undated. On, on the poster is divided into three distinct parts. The title is written at the top in big, bold letters. The last word, word, Top is larger than the others and appears in red in order to draw attention to the urgency of the matter of the matter and the dramatic force of the action which viewers are called upon to cork to carry out. Uh, do you understand me uh, pronunciation or is uh, too <laughs> too bad? Uh, clear. The important thing is that uh, you understand what I am reading. <coughs> the need uh, to take uh, 
Immediate action is explicitly and forcefully highlighted by the central fig figure <coughs> of the poster. The head of a South African child is cut between the jaws of a crocodile, here metaphorically represented by two bank checks. The reptile's menacing teeth appear along the borders of the checks. The words, pay two million francs, this is in French, but I need to this in English. Pay two million francs to the order of South Africa, to the order of apartheid. Appear, this phrase, appear on the lower shack. The words uh, at the bottom of the poster read, Campaign. 100,000 French citizens against uh, financing apartheid. This statement both informs viewers that a South African anti-apartheid campaign exists and invites them to take part. The methods used in anti-apartheid campaigns around the world not just in the West, involve a series of nonviolent actions. Two such actions have proven to be particularly effective. One, first, bank objection. This practice consists of withdrawing one's personal savings from a bank that has been publicly condemned, condemned for supporting South African apartheid and then depositing one's savings in a different bank that does not support the apartheid system. Second, boycotting banks. Banks that are either directly or indirectly involved in providing funds to the racist country. Boycotting normally consists of several nonviolent actions. For example, citizens garrisons distributing leaflets in front of the bank headquarters concerned and publicizing these actions on local and national media. Okay. <laughs> this is one of the most significant uh, parts of all of this. Uh, three languages, uh, German, Italian, and now English. Foreigner or native, in also uh, published in Bolzano, Bolzano, in Sud Tirol, in 2006. The problems of immigration, yeah. particularly those concerning the reception of immigrants, are common to all Western countries. The question posed by the title, Foreigner or Native, is rhetorical, as the X-ray might equally be that of an Italian citizen, as it might be that of a foreigner. The message is clear. Regardless of somatic traits of or cultural characteristics, internal organs are what matters in so far as they enable all human beings to live and make them equal before life and death, before suffering, health and sickness. Clear? Or have I to repeat? No, it's clear. No. It's getting clearer and clearer. It's so relevant. Yes. Mm -hmm. With uh, English, uh, not necessary. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
Now, um, I begin uh, to illustrate the this poster with uh, a very little, uh, what you see, the uh, uh, writing uh, the bottom, no? But it is very important. History has taught us that wars entail hunger. But we are less aware that mass poverty can itself lead to wars or end in chaos. Where hunger rules, peace cannot prevail. He wants to ban war, must also ban mass poverty. Morally, it makes no difference whether a human being is killed in a war or is condemned to starve to, star to death because of the indifference of others. And this is very actual because in uh, television we have a problem. Oh, immigrant uh, from war, yes. Immigrant uh, for <laughs> economy, no? Economy, uh, um, reasons? No. Out. This is exactly the opposite. Also, this um, phrase, this uh, uh, is uh, the, um, the title of the poster, written in large block characters, is taken from this passage of the Brandt Report. Perhaps you know the Brandt Report, 1980. Brandt was the Prime Minister of Germany, Germany. Uh, written uh, in small characters at the bottom of the poster. Uh, Brandt was also the President of uh, the Commission, Independent Commission, uh, on International Development Issues. And uh, uh, in 1980, after over two years' work, this commission approved a report, the Brandt Report, the name, which focused the public's attention on a new approach to the relationship between peoples and states based on independence. The report became a point of reference for all the organizations engaged in international cooperation. This is also very expressive of this report. Mm. Um, this also means. Yeah. Uh, an American poster published in Seneca. Seneca? Seneca, Seneca New York. Seneca, no? Yeah. Pronunciation, yeah. correct. Okay. Seneca in the New York State, United States, 1984. That in Seneca, New York, this poster chronicles the most important moments in Aboriginal and American women's fight against war and slavery and for the affirmation of human rights, beginning with their right to vote. The written formalization of this right is seen as a major victory for women. And the women here don't, uh, don't uh, defeat them. <laughs> uh, the books displayed on the table in the third segment, symbolize the value of this right. A book. This is a book no? on the table. It is little, but uh, it is there. there. The last uh, of the um, women's fights features in the bottom segment of the poster is the fight against nuclear arms, and not just those arms stored in the Seneca Army depot not just those arms. Indeed, the women pursue, they fight along with the 
community of resistance to nuclear arms and all ways of war, in solidarity with the European movement for peace. It's very important, it's not uh, very excellent, very beautiful, uh, nice uh, poster, but it's very impressive, very significant. Uh, <coughs> ah, it is necessary translation. Uh, it's the fifth uh, ecumenical week for peace, 16 24 October 1989 praying, informing and acting for justice, peace and the protection of creation. The image, featured in the middle of the poster, enclosed in a large circle, is the work of Father Arthur Pulley, Pulley. The naive style picture simultaneously symbolizes Christianity and Ecumenism. The foreground is dominated by a large tree covered in leaves and blossoms with its roots reaching deep into a subsoil rich in water. Water is the word of Christ. No? That feeds the various Christian denominations roots, leaves, and blossoms. Running uh, through the center of the poster and on each side of the tree are men and women living and praying with their arms raised to the heavens. Under the great crown of the tree which symbolizes the Christian churches united in Christ. In Christ. Also today, the care for the environment by Christian churches is very great. <coughs> See, for example, the recent Pope Francesco's encyclical Laudato Si. Mm -hmm. I think everybody knows that. We are well, only two more and then finish. This is one of the most beautiful poster we have in our uh, collection. Uh, men, nature, animals, they will either be saved or be lost together in CMS. Together is written in more bigger character. Also, this uh, poster has a, a record because he has no. No, no place of publication, no author, is any, it is undated. We know nothing about this post. Now, then you, we can also think about it. This uh, strikingly beautiful poster is both undated and unsigned by either author or sponsor. This seems to be an intentional omission, almost as if to suggest that the real authors of the poster are the four representatives of two natural kingdoms, the animal and the plant kingdoms. The heads of the bird, an eagle, the fish and the young man belong to the animal kingdom while the plant above them, below, belongs to the plant kingdom. The four figures are ingeniously depicted as mutually interlocking and blend so effectively with one author that at first glance they appear to be a single subject. Beautiful. The last, the last one. Mm. Uh, translation. It's a business worth billions. It's the business of death for the interests 
of a few. <coughs> this order is undated, because published in Milan. No. Looking at the image of this poster, we might also ponder over its, its inherent suggestion that soldiers are the only or primary victims of war. This may have been true until the First World War. From the Second World War on, however, war has caused an increasing number of casualties among civil civilian populations, while the number of dead and wounded soldiers has consistently dropped. Today, civilians alone account for almost 90% of all casualties in armed conflicts. I finish. <laughs> Now, uh, uh, Alberto Lodate is here and he must speak the most song about uh, his books. He uh, uh, published a lot of books. The last one is one of my preferred. <laughs> it's your favorite. One of your the last one, but it's going to be translated in English, but it's not yet finished. And uh, now I just want to say just a few words because uh, I think we have heard many things interesting and I think we, we would like to ask something. And this was uh, created by, you see, uh, Sun Tzu is a famous uh, general uh, 20 cent 25 centuries ago, a Chinese who wrote a book, The Art of War. It is quite an interesting book. And uh, I think uh, many of his lessons are good also for now. For example, he says, if we spend too much for war, and we forget to spend for civil needs, etc., we instead of uh, increasing the security of a country, we, we make it more, more feeble. And I think this is, and there are other things that are just good for peace. But there are something where I had to translate and to change completely in nonviolence. But I'm not going to speak about this. I would just would say that if you, some of you, is interested in studying Gandhi, in the library, in, in the political science library, there are about 300 books on Gandhi, about Gandhi, who have been given to us, me and my wife, as a prize in India by the Gandhi movement. And is there, and if you are interested, they are mostly in English, this book that you can uh, read them, you can have them, you can put in some, uh, make agreements with the library to get them, if you are interested to do, to study Gandhi and non-violence, the Gandhi and non-violence. And the other things I would like to say, he spoke about communism. Then the battle of communism is a battle we have won with non-violence. If uh, now there is no, in the place where before there were the bombs, there are no the bombs, the missile crews, now there is an airport, a civil airport. You can go there with a low price because instead of the cruise missile, there is a civil, civil airport. The interesting thing is that officially, the, the news that had been given to our government, through our government, to, to all the citizens, is that this was due uh, grace to the plantation of the cruise and other missiles. A New York University student 
and I remember the name of Louis, but he's late in here. He, he wrote three books about the movement. Mm -hmm. He's saying that this is a, is, a, is a story given by the Republican Party, but it's completely contrary to the reality. What convinced Reagan and Gorbachev to make the agreement was exactly the contrary, because there was this strong movement against missiles in USA, in England, in Holland, in Germany, in Italy, all over the world. And this convinced Reagan to change his idea and to try to, to take agreement with the Russian and Gorbachev gave reasons. And so they arrived to the hymn uh, was to eliminate missiles along the line, uh, <coughs> as it was uh, those who were in Kosovo. And so from then, it had been eliminated, the missiles. Uh, so I think this is important, because we think often of non-violence, uh, nice things, but ineffective. In reality, is the strongest uh, force we have. But we must know how to organize. We must study. We must prevent war. That is important because it's very easy to prevent. We know uh, this is book how, not me, but over the world, we know how to prevent war. But we don't pay anything to prevent war. We pay a lot of money to make war. And we don't follow the the lesson we have here about the prevention of war. So I think that is a duty you have, the new generation, study war, prevent, study how to prevent war, study peace. And for example, I think the last thing, there are three pillars of nonviolence. One is nonviolence direct action. My wife was one month in prison for doing blockade in Comiso. One thing I just, one day, and uh, <laughs> I feel <laughs> because just one day, she one month. And direct action is very important. The second one is non-collaboration to the something that is wrong, and conscientious objector, and other things like that are very important for that. And so one part of this are just for construction. And the third thing is a constructive project. And education for peace, peace, uh, peace um, museums, all these books are for a, a big part of constructive project, education for a new kind of society. These are the three pillars of nonviolence, and I hope you will follow these lessons. I will go on studying these things, working, researching, and uh, doing acting also for peace. Thank you. It's, it is indeed uh, a privilege to have two people who have. Uh, three people, four people, who have played such an important role in the very, very rich history of Italian pacifism and its many manifestations. Um, does anyone have any questions or any comments um, that they would like to, to share? Great. Could you tell us who you are, your student? Yes, no, I'm not a student. <laughs> okay. I was, okay. I was a student in international relations at the University of Florence, and I'm also active in the peace movement. In Wonderful. Italy. So, my first comment is I'd like to start. Why are you here? Oh, yeah. Uh, I work uh, as assistant of the Latino Dialogues. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so my first comment is uh, I would like to stress about the uh, women's central role in peace movement. So, you have to think that in 1915, while men were busy to uh, bring war all over the world, women uh, organized and they founded the 
Women's, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and it was 1915. So it was uh, 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 it was something really new, and so uh, it's something that I would like to stress. And then I have a question for you, uh, Professor uh, Absol, because I found really interesting these museums. Sometimes they have also been used as a reparation. Uh, but my uh, question is about the centrality of the uh, right representation of war, for example. So, and I'm referring to uh, the um, peace museums built in Japan. It was probably the most controversial issue in, uh, in US-Japanese relations because actually in the peace, mu in the peace museums in Japan, the representation was that the Japanese were victims of World War II, right. and right. so there is no, there is not a representation of the uh, act, for example, of aggression that they that they made, for example, in China. So I would like to hear from you a comment about the right representation of uh, facts and history. Okay, um, that's wonderful, wonderful question. I'm arguing in my book that peace museums overlap with museums for peace, and I go into a whole philosophy about that. And in Japan, you are absolutely right, the first peace museums were promoted actually by the occupation forces, which were the US occupation forces, and they were, um, they were museums, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, for example, which very much emphasized um, the victimization uh, of, uh, of the Japanese, the after effects of bombing. And, uh, and again, you don't see these kinds of images except the Dayton International Peace Museum in Dayton, Ohio actually had a exhibit on this. So that was a piece of it. But there are, there are between 60 and 70 small and large, quote, peace museums in Japan. There is actually a peace museum for comfort women in Japan. And interestingly, Hiroshima and Nagasaki peace museums gradually began to put in some images of what was done in uh, Korea, uh, Burma, and other places, and the Nanking rapes, etc. And of course, what happened is this became so controversial that some of these sites pulled back because of the protests against them. So the Peace Museum that I showed you is a very, probably the most progressive that exists. It's at a university, which makes me feel very good. It's a private university, uh, but, uh, but it has been open to tremendous pressure to pull back from its anti-nuclear stance. So you're absolutely right. Uh, I'm, I'm arguing that Peace Museums do more than show suffering do more than show um, uh, the terrible toll of war and conflict, but they also attempt to stand up to history. The Kyoto Museum for Peace has all these exhibits about, has some exhibits about China and the comfort women, but also they tend to look forward. What can you do in your community? Environment is a very important issue. Activities that joins children, young people, adults, senior citizens together. So I could just give a slice, but I think it's a very important issue sort of out here is um, uh, there are so many war museums. That's the predominant national museums. Um, there are an increasing number of sites of suffering. Um, I'm arguing these peace museums do a little something different. They have pieces of these other types of museums, but they're against war, primarily, and they're showing not only the suffering of war, but the possibility of, for example, in Guernica, there's a tool chest for peace. It contains all the things uh, Professor Bate was talking about. The tool chest includes dialogue, cooperation, uh, marches, and protest. So uh, again, those exist as well. But, but the Japanese Peace Museum movement, you're absolutely right, is quite broad. Thank you.
Yeah, I have. Uh, this is this is really very interesting, and um, I'm having a lot of thoughts. And I'm 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 happy you remarked the difference between the peace museums as something different from um, museum me me memorializing museums that memorialize some terrible event that per se is uh, educating towards peace because it's the, the event that it commemorates is so horrific that you can only opt for peace. But uh, I, I myself have never seen a peace museum, so because I don't think in Italy we have any. Yes, you have one. <laughs> Pass it for the project. See. Si. <laughs> uh, very, very specialized. I'll visit soon. But I was just thinking uh, at the uh, 9-11 memorial mm -hmm. and museum there. Now, you don't have there anything that I don't know if you, if everybody has been, I was there last year and I found it extremely interesting, but um, I, I, I cannot think of that as anything else but a, a site that invites to dial peace and uh, despite the $24 ticket that you have to pay to get in, <laughs> but anyway, um, that anything else but, you know, understanding peace and, and commemoration at the same time. So I'm... Uh, also thinking at, at the art installations outside the museum where the, the towers were. So I'm, uh, although I understand the difference in practice, I'm thinking at the memorial museums also as peace museums in a way, mm. or not? Am I well, I, you know, I gave a talk on this book to uh, in the Tamament Library, and when you all go back to NYU in New York, you should go to our library. We have this amazing collection, including from the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. And two people who worked in this, in, in, at the site, came to that talk, and they asked me about this. And of course, the narrative at the 9-11 Museum is a patriotic narrative. Yeah. And it, it, this is not what I'm, what, what, this I would differentiate. And they actually agree, very much agreed with me. When one ends that, and again, the, if any of you have been to the Nanking Peace Museum, when you get out of that huge place, with the youth structure, you'll think every, it, it, it depicts Japanese atrocities against Chinese to such a degree that one can't feel peaceful when one get, gets out. So I think that the nine, of course, politics is key in all of these museums, and the 9-11 memorial, um, there was a wonderful man whom we actually know from our network who actually put forth and got to the first round uh, of making this memorial and a memorial for remembering, but also for uh, reconciliation and forgiveness. He did not get it to the second round. Yeah. So again, this was a very political museum, as all are, and it is not a museum that, um, if you notice, there is very little about the background of the people who, who did, it, you know, it, it's very carefully orchestrated, and it's orchestrated very much to remember the atrocity um, and not to forgive in any way or to come forward. It's a very patriotic narrative, and I, that is not a peace museum, as I'm defining them. Okay, thanks. And one of the reasons I actually did this book is because um, as an educator, one of my early jobs was as a director of education at the Anne Frank Center. I began to feel very much with the exhibits that um, what are we teaching from learning from atrocity? And you as the students, how do we turn things around? And I think giving students more ideas, posters, content of peace we don't even have a language, oftentimes, of peace. I ask students, what does the term altruism mean? And sometimes they don't know. Uh, so we, so uh, they're really, the emphasis is different. Not that there isn't overlap, but the emphasis is different. So, of course, most people maybe would argue that the 9-11 Memorial is a peace museum or a museum for peace. I'm unfortunately a contrarian, and I have to argue, or my position really is, that really it isn't, it, it doesn't give you that sense. Others would argue it gives them a sense of healing. I don't think it moves the nation or the people 
uh, in that sense. It's who's the viewer. It's who's the, it's who's the viewer, who's the audience. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Emily. A comment and a question. Um, thank you, everybody, for these presentations. I love the overlap. It was, yes. It was really exciting um, to, to think about. Um, one comment has to do with the university and as being a site of peace museums or not. And I was just thinking, I don't know if this is an alternative reason, but of course universities as research institutions have That's often been tied to the war industry. So it would have been very interesting, actually, if it had been the University of Chicago and not the University of Illinois at Chicago that had one, because Fermilab was instrumental, of course, in, in developing the bombs. So that, just thinking about that history, um, I don't know where NYU stands. No, it's, I was just playing with all the students here. It's, it's, it's very difficult to get funding for museums. We have several beautiful sites, the NYU campus, uh, where I uh, like the Gray Gallery, etc. But uh, Professor Anzai, who was the head of the uh, Kyoto Museum, he was followed around when he uh, by, before he came. He was a physicist who who couldn't get tenure at Tokyo University because he was followed around because he took an anti-nuclear position, and only when he got to Kyoto was he able to both do his physics and become a peace advocate at the same time. So this is, this is very intense and very difficult. Yeah, you know, there can be very, I think, you know, a conflict of interest or competing pressures. But I was thinking about what you said, there's no real vocabulary for peace. And I was wondering if, as you've seen all these museums, if you've noticed a vocabulary emerge, like certain people who get quoted a lot or certain wars that get referenced, especially those that are not dedicated to a single you know, yes. issue or conflict, but yeah. the broader. I think Vittorio's collection, right? You have <coughs> posters of Gandhi. Yes. Uh, and certain kinds of recurrent Martin Luther King Jr. There are certain <coughs> kinds of idealized and idealized figured in the peace movement. In the peace in, in the in the poster collection that you yes, have, yes, yes. there are certain well-known international figures from yes. South Africa. Yes, 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 yes. The Mandela. Mandela. Um, um, Mandela. Um, Mandela. Um, Mandela. Um, Mandela. Um, yes, Mandela. Yes, Mandela. Tutu. Yes, Bishop Tutu. Yes, yes. Uh, and yes. so many, many others. Yes. Uh, Yes, yes, yes. And I think Professor Lovati could speak to, we have a language of peace. We just don't teach it and we don't know it. Yes, we have the language of peace. We have it? The language, we have the language of peace, but it's just people don't, that is not sort of the vocabulary. Altruism. One would think people would know at 18, I taught a course in the new school uh, uh, about, uh, about doing good. Mm -hmm. And the first day I asked 20 19-year-olds coming from all over the world, what, what does the term altruism mean, which means doing good? And no one knew. This was a self-select self, uh, group that chose a course on doing good, etc., and didn't have the vocabulary. So it's very telling. Uh, and then we talked about it in different languages. What would it mean if instead of knowing what drones were, which we know, we also know, knew what, uh, something more about dialogue or nonviolence or all the things that you mentioned in your talk? The constructive project is wonderfully important. I've been studying with uh, Gene Sharp in the United States and Harvard. And I criticize him because he gives too much importance to the strong, the struggle, the non-violent struggle. But I think the non-violent struggle is important, but the constructive project is equally important. Because when you struggle, you, have, you must have an idea of what kind of society you want to put after the society, the actual society. It's not enough democracy, as he said, because democracy has many faults. In, in Italy, we know that Berlusconi, with his money, could corrupt everybody, he could buy, he could... You see, when you have money, you can corrupt 
democracy. So we need a democracy, a grassroots democracy. And that's a complete thing. <coughs> so you must educate people, you must create small groups, etc. You must make dialogue, etc. Like I work with Danilo Dolci in Sicily for two years about. And we planned the the territory with the people themselves. It was one of the poor people of the village who say, why don't we construct a dam to have water and to have uh, to cultivate something better, etc. And it was made after nine years of struggles, etc. We got that, and now the, that is one of the best areas of Sicily because there were other dams built in Sicily, but there was no organization of the people. On the contrary, we organized people themselves, and so they, they control the water. They not, don't only have the dam, but they, with a cooperative, they control the water. On the contrary, all the other dams were constructed by the, the uh, our government, they are controlled by the mafia because they destroyed all the, how do you call it, the, the place to send down the water. They are destroyed, so the control of the water is by mafia. And so the only one who really in Sicily is working as a dam is that one where, because there was the struggle, there was the dam, but there was the organization of the population. And the idea came by poor men of the place, not by Danilo. Danilo just followed. So I think that is important things to go on. Do you think that there's a pattern? I mean, it's definitely easier to build a peace museum from the position of being a victim rather than the aggressor of the war. Do you think that there's a pattern as to who are the people who are more commonly establishing peace museums as victims or aggressors? And also, is there more likely to be change, like more significant change in the world if it's the aggressors that are the ones taking the first step to build these peace museums rather than the victims? I think that um, if, I'm not sure I followed everything. Uh, so uh, I, I, most, most museums, uh, are created by states, war museums, right? Those are the most common, or national museums, museums of patriotism. And I think the 9-11 memorial is very much in keeping with that kind of history. Peace museums are generally private. They're generally poorly funded. Uh, and um, and uh, they, uh, except for the one in Oslo, which the, the, the uh, uh, Norway helped fund because of their commitment to the Nobel Peace Prize. So I think it's going to continue to be a struggle. And one of the things these peace museums do that's really good is they have traveling exhibits. So for example, the Peace Museum in Bradford sends its museum, there's a permanent site in a military museum in Leeds right nearby. So I think we're going to continue, hopefully, to see kind of a cross fertilization. But we're talking about uh, a, a, a very minor, minority movement. But what I'm saying, and I think everyone here is saying, is that Passos is the name of the small peace museum in New York City, step by step, that one has to build uh, and educate about, uh, about peace. I'm not sure. Did I kind of answer it a little? Uh, kind of. I think it's just like um, when I hear you speak about peace museums and the kind of message they bring across, it's often built, um, if not by the state, but by like private um, organizations that speak from the point of view as a, someone that's been victimized. For example, like I know that you said the 9-11 memorial is not exactly a peace museum, but that's it's not like... Um, the terrorists constructed the 9-11. No, yeah, no, no. Or it's no, not the like victims, exactly. the victims. It's so, always, yes. Yeah. It's the, but I'm saying that sites that, that memorialize, mm -hmm. like the 9-11 Museum, are not Chinese museums. Yeah, yeah. Now, other people might argue yeah. that they are. 
and the peace museums also increasingly are talking about the environment, and they're talking about what uh, Vade was saying, a future. Yeah. What can we do to help? How can we engage? And all of these peace posters also, they represent the past, but what would Casa per la Pace is, what can we learn from all of these posters and all of these exhibits? Allora, io vorrei dire questo. I would like to say this. Es, sono importanti i poster. È importante il libro di Joyce sui musei. It's important the posters and Professor Assel's book. È importante il libro di Labate che fa fare dei ragionamenti sui comportamenti. And the book on the art of peace. Ok. E, um, io credo che sia quindi importante capire perché si innescano i motivi per far pensare alla gente che la guerra è In quest'ultimo manifesto si parla del fatto che è un interesse di pochi. Costruttori di armi, coloro che vogliono sfruttare il territorio, come oggi succede per i territori, ma l'importante è capire i vari meccanismi che sono sotto a ogni situazione. Allora io per questo vorrei ricordare, so for this I want, I want to remember, o abbiamo visto un, un anno fa one year ago, una rappresentazione a representation teatrale all'interno di un cimitero tedesco. Within a German cemetery. Io non ricordo il nome dell'autore. I don't Forse remember the author. Krauss. Krauss, so is the name of the author. Yeah. E, um, in questa rappresentazione, in this representation, muovendosi in vari uh, punti del cimitero, points of the cemetery, hanno fatto vedere come uh, si è preparato prepared, la popolazione tedesca German population, a credere che fosse importante to that it was important, ed essenziale and essential, la guerra. The war. In realtà era uh, interesse di pochi personaggi, in re, the of only a few industriali, e uh, però le maestre indottrinavano gli alunni, taught, taught their students, i giornali uh, raccontavano dei guai che c'erano e che bisognava sanare nel territorio. Quindi è chiaro che eh, ci sono delle, ci possono essere delle trame, delle idee che, so che eh, creano delle spaventi, per cui la, la guerra diventa indispensabile. So it, like it, it showed the necessity of why this war was absolutely necessary. E avendo fatto questa rappresentazione all'interno di un cimitero, so having this representation at the center of the cemetery, si è proprio capito il significato assurdo di, di quanti giovani of how many erano young people morti e c'erano punti e si vedevano le date di nascita e di morte. Quindi ogni mezzo è utile a far pensare. So it's necessary to think. Um, un pullman è forse in più giorni della settimana da Bologna arriva so a alla Futa. Fruta. Fruta passa, il passo della Futa. Alto ah, Appennino che divide la Emilia dalla Toscana. So it's a, a point that divides Emilia Romagna, a region in Italy, mm -hmm. towards Tassi, yeah. da yeah. Toscana. Yeah. 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 Quindi io credo che sia importante proprio che le persone tutte ragionino su tutti i mezzi che possono far decodificare 
i messaggi che arrivano dalla TV, dai giornali. It's important to understand the messages that arrive in TV, in the journal. E ragionare sui temi che propongono libri e, e manifesti e, e, e musei. Quindi è un panorama che bisogna. Che, che la idea di quella non è necessaria. Sì. Yeah, so it's important to understand that these images and these ideas that you're getting from television and radio and newspapers that um, have propaganda in favor of war is not necessarily, it's not necessary, but sometimes what they're portraying says that it is necessary. Allora, Thank you. No, Thank you. per dare un riferimento maggiore a sì. questo spettacolo teatrale, allora cito il, il nome, ho detto Carl, è Karl Kraus, un commediografo tedesco. So the name of this author, come si chiama? Karl Kraus. 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 E a chi ha scritto appunto una, una dramma teatrale intitolato... He did a, a, a dramatic theatrical piece. Intitolato, eh, ordine in inglese, The Last Days of the Mankind. Oh, Last Days of Mankind. Yes. Well, okay, so if anybody's interested in, in that's... Uh, negli anni 30, tra l'altro. Dopo 90, 30. In, in, uh, in year uh, 30. 30. 30s. Ah, yes, yes. I, I want to thank uh, Love Pietro again, and Alan in particular, for once again giving peace a chance <laughs> and allowing us the privilege of being here and to all the people who came right before your exams and everything and how busy everyone is, we are so appreciative. And each of us in our own way, step by step, can help build a dam, can collect a poster, can visit a peace museum. It's really up to us. Thank you so much. I would like to add something to see if it came out that uh, the money is interesting. Of course, uh, if you think that the, the five countries where the control of the United Nations are sending 80% of the big arms over the world, so they are more interested to to war than to peace. I think not uh, the only big reason. The other big reason is the fact the international law still allows countries law to decide war and peace. They are owner of the decision of law. So we are still in a, how do you call it, in medieval uh, law. So if you study law, you must study how to change the international law. Because the international law is really something above over 200 centuries. Because all over the countries, when there is something wrong, there is, a, there is police, there is a, a, a court, there is something to judge, etc. International level, no. You see, the United States say, you know, I am the policeman, I am the cousin, and so the other country. They decide to work by themselves. They have the right to this. That is terrible. And so this is one of the reasons we have to study. And I wrote a book I left here in English, the Mental Learn Analysis and Research for Peace. And uh, if you are interested, you must study research and study peace. How to research for peace? The book I've given to the, your library, you can ask in English, and uh, you can study on it, etc. I teach this methodology of peace research for the University of Galton online. So from my house, I write. <laughs> I have students from the United States, not many, but from uh, South America, from Africa, from India, from Europe also, etc. Always online. And if you are interested to Transcend University, who publish also these books, Transcend University are invited to follow my lessons. <laughs> 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 <laughs>